only mystery in my lifetime. Just drives you crazy. It was May 23rd, 1948. The tug Robert Gray was heading upriver from Portland. Two of our young employees, Captain and Deckhand, was bringing the boat back up to the Dalles, Oregon. The sun was out. The tug passed through Bonneville. The Columbia was 17 feet above flood stage. Called in on, on the radio about 30 minutes from the Dalles. A routine call, all normal. That's the last we heard of them. The Robert Gray sank and was never found. The boat belonged to Captain Slim Lapilato. It was one of many boats he and his competitor, Lou Russell, lost to the rapids of the Columbia, one of the toughest rivers in the world to navigate. These men pioneered commercial transportation on the upper Columbia and opened one of the nation's most isolated regions to the markets of the world. How would you like to have uh, $10 million? You know, that's what you're responsible for. And uh, you got guys down there that are sleeping in their bunk. You're responsible for their lives as well as your own, you know. A lot of responsibility. These guys were doing it when it was rough. We're doing it when it's pretty darn nice. We got the best equipment. If they drive to accomplish something that you feel you can do, and everybody else, 100%, are exactly confident that you can't do it. It took people like us. The panty waste wouldn't make it in that business. In the early 30s, the Columbia Basin had the potential to supply fully one-third of all the grain exported from the United States, if a way could be found to bring the grain to market. Jim Hill managed the Pendleton Grain Growers Cooperative. No, the uh, farmers had had so much trouble over the years fighting the railroads about uh, rates and so forth that just anything that even offered a, a possible solution to that, they were all for it. They just, it was like manna from heaven. For an area the size of Texas, there were no ports, few roads, and no reliable rail service. The river route began on the Snake River at Lewiston, Idaho, and met the Columbia River near Pasco, Washington. To reach the calmer water below the Dalles, Oregon, a captain had to push a tug and barge almost as long as a football field through nearly 100 rapids. But at the end of the run was pure profit, the potential to make millions. There was only one thing I've ever been able to do in my life that I could say I'd done good. There were two things. I could always run a boat very good, and I could always fly on an airplane good. None of and those were just like natural things for me. After many wrecks and lost loads, stern wheelers had stopped running the Upper Columbia. It was too dangerous. Slim Lapilato believed that high-powered tugs designed for fast water could do the job, despite what everyone was telling him. Competitors and the railroads and everybody says, hell, leave them alone. They'll, elements will get them. I think he's the type of person that if someone tells him he can't do it, then he'll spend the rest of his life trying to do it. And I think that's a lot of my father. In the mid-30s, the farmers took a chance on Lapalado, But when the barge got stuck in the rocks of Salado Falls, he lost the load and with it his entire investment. I had committed myself for a several millions of dollars in equipment. And all of a sudden, your earning power is cut off entirely. You've got five cents in your pocket, and you start wondering, well, where do, where do I go from here? He asked his creditors to stick with him. The thing that brought us out of it, that I was able to go to all, of, all the people that I owed money to and say, if you'll just give me a little time, I'll work out of this. I don't think I could do that today. I started off, my first boat cost me $65, my first barge cost me two, 250 During construction of the Bonneville Dam, Lou Russell tested the water with his own diesel tugs. His boat and barge designs are unique, even by today's standards, and helped make commercial navigation of the Upper Columbia possible. 
you don't realize until you start, stop and look back and realize that you are part of history, you are part of development. Its locks will enable shipping to use this great waterway much further inland than at present and give an outlet to the enormously valuable agricultural and mineral products of Washington and Oregon and Idaho. President Roosevelt came to Oregon in 1937 to dedicate Bonneville, the first major dam on the Columbia River. But despite the dam, long stretches of the Upper Columbia remained wild. Sam McKinney is the coordinator of the Columbia River Heritage Program at the Oregon Historical Society. At 15, he was a deckhand on the Georgie Burton, the last sternwheeler to run the Columbia. Current downhill, rocks on the bottom of the river, wind blowing up, ice and snow, you have the dimension of the upper Columbia River. Now your job is to get a tugboat through this thing all seasons of the year, night and day, keep on going, deliver the goods. That's a tough job. There were no charts, no range markers, no radar, just six men and a tugboat. There were so many places that it was really tight. I mean, you had to be on right on top of it. And, you know, if you weren't, you were in big trouble. Each set of rapids had its own challenges. Captains had to know them like a driver knows the twists and turns of a steep mountain road. Only a few of the men who steered boats through these waters are alive today. Captains Walt Smith and Daryl McBride remember the river as it used to be. Yeah, you bet it was a thrill. He was doing something that, that at that time was maybe uh, out of the two companies that were working up here at that time, you're probably only talking about 20 people at the most that could, uh, could do this, you know, and you were one of them. Maybe it was the same kind of feeling when a, when a, uh, a really good diver makes a good dive and then he gets out of the pool and he looks over there and it's nine, 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 ten. <laughs> For a tug and barge, the John Day Rapids was one of the trickiest. The John Day River entered the Columbia here, pushing the current at 35 miles an hour. Rocks threatened on both sides. What took an hour and a half going up would take three to four minutes going down. Well, I think pro uh, probably Umatilla Rapids was the worst for yeah. the reason that it was so long. At Umatilla Rapids, fast current. Water is so shallow you could stand up in it. And below, rocks tough to spot. On board, a captain cranking the power to maximum and more. There were some people that would, uh, would sweat, some people that would shake a little bit, some people that would drink more coffee, some people that would drink or smoke a lot more cigarettes. If, if it wasn't said in so many words, it was understood that when you went into one of them rapids up there in those days, you either got over or you blew an engine up. There was only one way to do it, and that was the right way. Any other way was disaster. Celilo Falls. For Native Americans, Celilo was a trading center, the best place on the river to catch salmon. Trolley cars would ferry men out to the prime fishing spots above the falls. Towboat men used a canal to go around the 80-foot drop. In April 1948, Burl Red and Mickey Martin were on board one of Russell's barges several miles upriver. They had a barge tied up at the mouth of Deschutes, and these guys were on it when it oh, broke yeah. loose, and it came down around the corner here by Salila Park, where it exists today. It went out and was going to go over the falls. Yeah, one of them grabbed onto one of the fishermen's uh, trolley lines and tried to walk across on, with his hands on that, and uh, the other one jumped in and tried to swim to shore. And they both drowned. If they'd have stayed on the barge, they wouldn't have had no problem at all. And his shoes were still on the barge when I picked it up here at, at Big Eddie Locks up here. This was the only place in the world where barges were operated in rapids like we had. And it was so bad that we never hired anybody that had ever been on a boat before, because if we did, 
The first time that boat got close enough to the beach, they'd jump off. Too young to be scared. Mark Nichols was 17 when he started as a deckhand. And that might be why they use kids, other than the fact they didn't have to pay us any money. Um, but I, I think that's probably because young people are fearless. It took seven years for a deckhand to make captain, a tough apprenticeship. If a three-ton engine failed mid-trip, the crew would have to pull ashore and fix it. If a tug hit rocks, whoever was piloting forfeited his own mattress to plug the hole. The crew would be gone from home for weeks at a time. Joe Sabuco left home at 17 to work on the boats. I've neglected being at school function with my kids. I've neglected being at a lot of things that I should have been. We had trips planned. Lou Russell come, say, would you work five days over? Sure. When you spend eight to 10 hours a day earning a living and you don't enjoy what you're doing, you're a damn fool. I've loved my work. It's a Umatilla. I worked on that boat. That's the Umatilla, which was At the visitor center at Bonneville Dam, Lou Russell explains boat. to his wife, Sandra, to how he started on the river, working summers on his father's steamboats. So how old were you when you worked on that boat? Well, I was 13, but that boat back in... He's somebody that um, knows what he wants, knows how to get it, and doesn't stop until he has it. And I found that I've been able to handle boats as well as anybody I've known. I've had a natural ability to do that. At 36, he was running the company, determined to make it the best. I'd made my mind up early in the game after battling with leaky tugs and leaky barges that I was gonna have the finest equipment with the finest men running them. Now he's your boss. How, what did you call him? Oh, uh, Lou. He was one of the one of the guys. The deckhand didn't call him Slim. I don't even know if the captains did. It was <clears throat> it was Cap Lopalato to me, and I, you know, maybe like if the president drove up, I wouldn't say hi, George. <laughs> Third River Barge Line, book twenty-six. Slim Lopalato has chronicled his life in fifty-four scrapbooks of newspaper clippings, and another seventy of photographs. My mother came over from Finland as a 17-year-old girl, all by herself. My dad was killed in a coal mine accident approximately a month or so before I was born. He grew up poor. Almost nothing could keep him away from the water, not even the severe burns he got when a tugboat exploded. Went to the hospital, and they took all my clothes away from me, and uh, I forget who came to the hospital, and I says, give me some damn clothes so I can get the hell out of here. Mm -hmm. Starting his business on the river during the Depression, Lapalato had no choice but to succeed. In my day, you didn't have anybody to turn to. If you, you couldn't make it on your own, that was the end of you. He was an excellent co competitor. I had doubt to him. He made me better, and I made him better. Soon after Lou Russell and Slim Lapalato started to work on the upper river, there were 43 tugboat companies competing for business. By the early 50s, there were two. Russell and Lapalato were fighting each other as much as they were the river. Lou loved to take a dig at me, and I guess I loved to take a dig at him. That was part of our game, like a couple little boys. Well, you practically never get Slim and the Russells together uh, in one room, but because uh, they would just they would just fight like uh, they were just like Hatfields and McCoys. Well, I I guess I never trusted Lou Ru Lou Jen Jr. I never was able to trust him. Routine competition turned to hardball when a group of farmers formed a company called Columbia Barge Lines to compete with Lapalato and the Russells. Lapalato says he and Russell's father made a gentleman's agreement that neither one would attempt to buy the farmer's tug, called the Rampant. He runs right around the corner, picks up the telephone, and makes a deal with, with Columbia Barge Lines to charter their tug and barge. So I thought, well, I better keep an eye on this guy, I guess. So I had one of my welders go over and buy a couple of shares of Columbia River, Columbia, Columbia Barge Line stock. He soon learned that the Russells were planning to buy the farmer's tug outright. 
at a Columbia Barge Line stockholders meeting. Lapalato took his shares and went to the meeting. And we're all sitting around the meeting and uh, jobbing around, breathing the head of the meeting says, well, Lapalato, if you get your fanny out of here, we'll go ahead with this meeting, with the stockholders meeting. I hauled out this couple of shares of stock, and I said, I'm a stockholder. You just heard a pin drop. Lapalato undercut the Russells. He offered less money to buy out the farmers, but he offered it up front. They never had no meeting. Everybody dunk out of the room, got their stock, and brought it up there. By noon that day, we owned Columbia Barge Lines. They, uh, they would accuse each other of cutting rates. They would accuse each other of doing special things to win my customer. You went and did this to get my customer, and you went and sneaked in there and did this, and I, and, and that kind of a thing. And uh, uh, it was just, uh, it was just highly, uh, highly high competition, I guess you'd call it. But it he did have a reputation of being tough. And so did you. Yeah, only I was tougher. Russell saw his chance to prove it when Lapalato lost a barge in the rocks below Salilo Falls. Insurance company put the barge up for sale. And I thought, well, hell, nobody's going to sell a bit on that barge but us. So I just sat by and... Lapalato collected the insurance money for his stranded barge, but he thought he could reclaim the barge for free if no one submitted a bid to the insurance company to salvage it. But Lou Russell did. For Russell, the barge, worth $100,000, was a steal. So he got the barge. <laughs> Tried pulling on it and ballasting it and all the tricks I could think of, and I couldn't get it off, so finally my dad made arrangements with the Corps of Engineers to raise the river three feet. Nearly 400 miles upriver at Grand Coulee Dam, the water was released. It took four days to reach the stranded barge. Anyway, as soon as the water hit there where well, the barge came off and then it got in this big eddy and I had to run it down to catch it because I had it ballasted down the stern and it would go about four miles an hour right for a rock bluff and then stop about 10 feet from the bluff and turn around and go someplace else. It never touched but it scared the heck out of me. They were, they were times like two little kids really. <laughs> what was the feeling between these two companies? Well I think we all respected each other's abilities but very competitive very competitive. Uh, we were always thinking that uh, you want to get to the locks before the other company, or if there was only one place to tie a barge up, you want to be the first guy there to tie it up. When the Dalles Dam was under construction, the river was squeezed through a narrow channel between the construction site and Big Eddie Locks. I remember Father used to, he had to run all the tugs up through that, and he'd come on there and the skipper was on that boat, he'd just shake his head. And father racked those engines up and he said, you can't do that, you can't do that, Captain. And he'd just keep racking them up and the black smoke's pouring out. The <laughs> skipper's sitting there just waiting for those engines to blow up. The water got so crazy and wild that you could not take a loaded barge upstream. The competition turned wild, too. The Corps of Engineers provided a dock for each company to pump petroleum above the dam site. But when one pump broke, they had to share the one that worked. So about 10 o'clock at night, uh, I got a call from one of my captains at Slim had come down there and shut the pumps off. Russell headed for the pumps, taking no chances. So I put on my crash helmet I used for jumping horses in those days. Just in case I got whopped on the deck, I'd be able to get back up again. And I loaded my brother and in our automobile, who was an ex-marine sergeant trained for killing. For both men, time was money. When Slim came back down to shut off the pump, I pointed out to him that he'd better not do that or he's going to get whomped. And he decided that maybe I was right. Couldn't see any, any situation to get into fisticuffs just because a couple of brothers were a little bit up in arms. And you did nothing wrong? Not in my estimation. Uh, you know, at one time, the two companies weren't close at all. In fact, we had orders that, hey, you can't touch this guy, you can't touch, you can't tie up to his docks. If he's aground, leave him aground. And I mean, th this thing really got really going after a while, you know. And of course, the personnel on the boats, they're the ones that really took it hard because, hey, we're just the same. We're doing the same job and everything else. And if we see, even though he's a competitor at ground, we're going to pull him off, you know. But, boy, if they were caught doing any of that, uh, oh, yeah. things were getting rough on you. Thank 
1948, an early snow melt brought the worst flood in 50 years to the Columbia Basin. Then it rained. Above Grand Coulee Dam, Roosevelt Lake was full and backing water into Canada. By treaty between the United States and Canada, the water had to be released. At Umatilla, the river crested at 28 feet above flood stage. Above Bonneville, the river claimed the tug Robert Gray. In Portland, the community of Vanport was destroyed. 50 people died in the flood. The winter of 1949 was as cold as the previous winter had been warm. The river was frozen solid. Towns above Bonneville were cut off and needed heating oil. Keith Rodenbaugh, captain of the Windquat, was trying to break through. It took us probably a week to make one trip sometimes. Sometimes we wouldn't even go anything. One day we would maybe move a mile, mile and a half. Just cold and miserable. When that wind was whistling by that pilot house, it sounded if you had laid on a railroad track and had a train run over the top of you, it couldn't have been more terrifying. There has never been another freeze like the one of 1949. McNary Dam was finished that year, covering Umatilla Rapids. The dams not only covered the rapids, they lessened the threat of ice and floods. You know, it's like a ferry boat now. I mean, there's, there's no problems. And back in the old days, now those were problems, and that was fun. The floodgates closed on the Dalles Dam in 1957, covering Celilo Falls. When the dam was finally blocked, the Indians came down to watch it fill. They didn't believe it could happen. And then all of a sudden, the water was still. End of everything. End of 10,000 years. The salmon, the falls, their place of worship. In 1968, the John Day Dam would flood the last section of rapids on the Columbia River. On the Snake, four more dams would be built to complete the 465-mile inland waterway between Lewiston, Idaho, and the Pacific Ocean. Never had a river changed so much so quickly. You guys must have been glad when all the dams came along to make the, the ride a lot smoother. Well, most of the boys that worked for me were kind of disappointed. They said it got too tame. They liked that challenge of the swift water and everything. Lapalato sold inland navigation in the late 50s. The river offered few challenges for him. He started boat businesses in Alaska and the offshore oil fields of California and Louisiana. He is 81 now. He and his wife, Frances, live in Vancouver, Washington, near the water. He works every day. What is it about the water? It's worse than cocaine. <laughs> we decided that the two of us decided we were going to live on boats the rest of our lives. Lou Russell lives on a redesigned oil exploration vessel on Seattle's Lake Union with his wife, Sandra. When he retired and sold Tidewater barge lines in the 80s, the company held a virtual monopoly on commercial transportation on the Upper Columbia. You made millions, didn't you? Well, I made quite a bit, yeah. yeah. Millions? Yes, quite a few millions. You made a few millions, didn't you, really? <laughs> Good. I don't know. I never counted them. Every farm. Every wheat field from there on down to here owes a lot to these men uh, because they haul their products down here. Down here where it goes to where it goes into a ship, where it goes off to the markets of the world. When both men came to the Upper Columbia, not much grain moved downriver. In 1989, four million tons passed through Bonneville locks and the ports of the Columbia are the leading exporters of agricultural products on the West Coast. Yeah, those were tough days. Uh, we had our time of uh, iron men and wooden ships here on this river, the same as they did on the sea. I would fire captains of mine today if they would do things I did when I was a youngster as a captain. Now, this sounds terrible, but I've had such a wonderful life that I don't regret anything that I've done.
Lou Russell has been battling cancer for more than a year. The bitter feelings about his battle with Slim Lapilato are fading. You know, it's very interesting, but until we started discussing that, I never realized that we were so much alike. We are a whole bunch alike. That's probably why we were such fierce competitors. It'd been very interesting to see what happened if we'd worked together. The Russell family was a very close knit family. He uh, he was very dedicated to his mother. Uh, always had a lot of respect for Lou and for his father. I think that secretly I've always admired him, and I have a hunch he's probably admired what I've done. Um, and there is no hatred between Slim Lopletto and myself. Uh, it was just a natural, competitive thing of two different people, and out of it came excellence. And that's the American way. The great rivers of the Pacific Northwest, the Columbia, the Willamette, and the Snake. The lifeline of shippers linking everyone who lives and works in the Inland Empire to the rest of the world. Tidewater Barge Lines has been navigating these waters for over 50 years, providing industrial river transportation service from Astoria to Lewiston. But it isn't longevity alone that accounts for the success of Tidewater Barge Lines. It's dedication to efficiency, cost-effectiveness, and innovation. Barge Lines is a full-service transportation company, leading the field in cargo delivery on the Columbia Snake River system, providing multiple barge towing capability through the entire network of eight locks and dams. The tugs range from 450 to 3,600 horsepower and are capable of 12 knots with a full tow. Part of Tidewater's fleet of tugs is committed to the movement of barges on the Columbia and Willamette, as well as other general harbor work, such as ship assisting. has the tug power for ship bunkering and harbor transfers of petroleum. Tidewater also offers dredging and craning, 
utilizing the Seahawk crane, which is capable of producing 3,000 tons of sand and gravel per ship. Now, offering all these services is one thing, but delivering consistently and reliably is another. It takes a particular mixture of equipment, people, and a special attitude. Tidewater has the sophisticated, powerful tugs needed to do the job, and the terminal and storage locations up and down the river to provide full service. Tidewater has working terminals at Vancouver, Umatilla, Pasco, and Wilma, serving the Lewiston area. Each terminal facility features the most modern in offloading equipment and facilities for the transfer of barges to rail and truck transportation modes. Petroleum barges are loaded at the lower Columbia River terminals at the major oil companies for shipment to the upriver terminals. Portland, Longview, Vancouver, and Kalama are the final destinations for grain and other cargoes from the Inland Empire. The East Pasco Terminal covers 150 acres and receives and ships petroleum via pipeline to and from Spokane, Washington. It has 33 tanks for storage of refined petroleum and truck loading facilities for shipping gasoline and fuel oil to points all over eastern Washington, eastern Oregon, and Idaho. Tanks are also ready for diversified storage of fertilizers, chemicals, caustic soda, asphalt, molasses, liquid emulsions, residual heating oils, and cement for a total storage capacity of 30 million gallons. Umatilla has a storage capacity as well for over 11 million gallons. The Wilma Terminal is the newest, most diversified, and furthest upriver of the Tidewater Terminals. It features containerized cargo as well as storage and shipping facilities. To facilitate the fast, efficient movement of cargo, the Wilma facility features state-of-the-art container cargo handling. Tidewater tugboats contain the very latest in navigation and communications electronics. The Tidewater, the company flagship and namesake, is the most powerful of the fleet, producing 3,600 horsepower of towing force with its two Fairbanks Morris engines. Tidewater has become known in the shipping industry as innovators who set the pace with ideas that accomplish tasks quickly and more efficiently. Ideas like two-way barges that allow an upriver shipment of petroleum and a downriver shipment of grain in the same barge as well as self-loading barges. This unique design allows storage of grain in the top section of the barge for downriver shipment and for the upriver tow Petroleum is stored in the outer hull compartment. Another Tidewater innovation is the Sundial Tug, a specially designed tug that is narrow enough to allow the transport of two barges at a time through the Bonneville locks. Yet it is powerful enough to push a multi-barge tow to Bonneville over Garrison Rapids. Now, anybody who knows the Columbia River system knows about Tidewater barge lines. They're the biggest on the river. But most folks don't get to know the people behind Tidewater, the ones who make the cargoes move, people whose skills and experience translate into superior efficiency and service to the customer. 
Tidewater's seasoned captains have over 470 years of combined experience guiding valuable cargoes up and down the river from Astoria to Lewiston. Tidewater's barge crews are familiar with the river and experienced in maneuvering their tugs and barges. Tidewater's dry dock and shipyard crews are continually busy refurbishing equipment at the yard in Vancouver and engineering new equipment to keep the Tidewater fleet the most modern on the river. At the Sundial Yard in Troutdale, new tugs and barges are being constructed to add to Tidewater's ever-growing fleet. In the Tidewater offices, dispatch people, office personnel, and maintenance crews contribute to the team effort that has made the company a leader. Now, other companies may have equipment and people, but it takes more to be the industry leader on this system. It takes the smarts to put it all together into an efficient, cost-saving service for shippers. Tidewater maximizes the use value of its fleet by dispersing the horsepower among three areas of the river system. The first area is the stretch from lower river ports to Bonneville. Empty grain barges and loaded petroleum barges are moved up to Bonneville Dam. There they are exchanged for loaded grain barges. The second area is the long haul from Bonneville to Pasco. This is where the most powerful tugs operate, shuttling barges back and forth on the Columbia. The third leg of the system goes between Pasco and Lewiston. Tugs working the Snake River move container barges, loaded downbound grain barges, and upbound petroleum barges. Tidewater's full-time crews aren't shuffled from boat to boat. They stay on their boat for two-week shifts, 24 hours a day, so that they know their equipment, their boat, and the river. Tidewater has become a vital force in each of the communities it serves, providing jobs and stability to the local economies. You know, Tidewater has logged over a half a century on these rivers and has become the leader in industrial transportation, modern equipment, and terminals. They're known as experienced people with innovative ideas. That's right, Bill, but there's another factor that has helped make the Tidewater story, and that's attitude. An attitude of pride, of individual responsibility for quality, and the ethic of hard work. Three great rivers, one great barge line. Tidewater barge lines, helping build a better life by linking the Northwest with the rest of the world. Six hours on, six hours off, 15 day tours, pushing cargo on the Columbia. The tug becomes their home. There is the river and the tow. For the Tidewater crews, it's a way of life out here.
Tidewater's story began in the early 1930s when steamboats struggled through dangerous currents and rapids. The country was in depression and transport of grain by rail was costly. An enterprising young man, Lou Russell Sr. started a business trucking cargo to and from steamboats, which hauled soap, beer, and diesel upstream and wheat downstream and cut into the railroad's monopoly. Sixteen tugs and 125 barges carry grain, wood chips, petroleum, and containers on a river system stretching from Astoria, Oregon to Lewiston, Idaho. In the 50s, the worst rapids were shallow and barges scraped bottom or hit rocks in the channels. Going upriver, tugs often would blow a piston, drift back out, fix the engine, and try again. Tidewater hired a young man fresh from the mining community of Wallace, Idaho as a deckhand. Ray Hickey was to play a major role in the company's future. The fleet is constantly upgraded and expanded. Tugs are repowered with new engines for fuel economy, low maintenance, and emission control. The Pioneer, launched in 1994, is the largest inland liquid barge in the U.S., meeting and exceeding the standards of the Oil Pollution Act of 1990. The company began hauling petroleum and needed a place to store it, purchasing a storage area on the Upper Columbia. In the early 50s, Tidewater Terminal Company had two locations, and Ray was chief engineer of the Leland James. By 1955, he was working in the Ocean Division and, after 12 years, was promoted to manager of this division. In 1970, he was in charge of all company operations. Tankermen performed the technical operation of loading and unloading liquid cargo at Tidewater's four terminal locations, which major oil companies use as distribution points. The container yard equipment moves containers from barge to rail to truck, providing business opportunities for small farmers and industry. In the early 70s, the last of the dams was in, and the kid from Idaho was general manager, and in 1977, became president of Tidewater. He purchased Sundial Marine to expand the fleet in response to increased grain traffic. Steel workers, welders, machinists, and electricians at Sundial handle all phases of steel construction, machine, engine, and electrical work for ship repairs, as well as dry dock and wet dock services. A new service is voyage ship repair. Mobile teams travel to another port or facility for repairs, or may even board a ship and work en route. By the early 80s, Hickey's dream was realized. He bought Tidewater in 1984. Through sundial construction, a new floating crane was built, more equipment was added, and a new family member was born, Hickey Marine Enterprises. Crane operators, engineers, boat handlers, and pile bucks build and repair docks dredge and pile drive, improving transportation needs and accessibility the length of the river.
Today, the Tidewater family of companies offers a diverse and full complement of marine services. All of the integrated services were developed because of Tidewater's commitment to answer the customer's needs. Tidewater had always taken its environmental stewardship seriously and created a spill response company before oil pollution standards were mandated. Tidewater Environmental Services has 10 equipment locations along the Snake and Columbia Rivers and can respond to liquid spills within an hour. An oil hose overflow in Longview, a train derailment in Stevenson, a pesticide tank overflow by a stream in an orchard. Tidewater Environmental is on standby for Tidewater and any company along the system needing emergency attention. Columbia Resource Company offers another transportation opportunity, barging containers of solid waste to a regional landfill in eastern Oregon. The Crystal Dolphin, an 84-foot hospitality vessel, is available for charter. Ray Hickey walked out of the hills of Idaho, found the Columbia River, and made it his life. His vision and commitment brought Tidewater to where it is today. When wheat exports were down, railroads deregulated, and rate wars were fierce, many expected Tidewater to go under. In a daring move, Hickey bought out the competitors, business turned around, and Tidewater prospered. As the river system has developed, as customer needs change, as technology advances, Tidewater leads the way for maritime transport from ocean to inland desert. Tidewater, a commitment to serving customers, providing the best equipment, having the best employees, and to preserving the health of the river.